Thank the member. Recognize the member from Vancouver Point Grey. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. <laughs> Honourable Speaker, uh, I rise to oppose this bill and uh, uh, with my colleagues uh, to speak about the problems with it and encourage the government to adopt some measures uh, to, uh, to back away from this plan and to engage in consultation with the communities that will be affected. I think it's helpful to start because it's easy to get distracted by, uh, by some of the things we've heard about what's actually on the table here, Mr. Chair. Uh, this bill proposes to remove agricultural protection as the key consideration for 90% of ALR land. 90%. Yes, all of Zone 2. All of Zone 2. That's, that's correct. Preserving agricultural land and farming will be only one of a series of factors the Commission members must consider. And so it's no longer the primary consideration. That only remains in Zone 1. So 90% of the ALR land. The second thing is, this bill proposes to do, is to create regional panels. And that seems on its face to be a, a, neutral, uh, a neutral initiative. And, and I, look, I, I look forward to, uh, to bringing to the attention of the uh, members opposite research from people who have dedicated their lives to looking at this issue around regional issues. And then the last piece is uh, the, the bill proposes to remove key markers of independence for the Commission. So in law, in administrative law, Member you look Vancouver at Mark Point Grey has the floor, please. Members? 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 The Vancouver member from Vancouver Point Grey has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It proposes to remove key markers of independence for the Commission. So in law and administrative law, you look at the independence of a Commission. Do they have the ability to appoint their own members? Do they have their, uh, the ability to set their own priorities? And this bill proposes to remove those key markers of independence. And I heard, I heard a member opposite ask, well, how much, how much farmland is in your constituency? And he's right. I live, in an, I, live in an urban, I live in an urban constituency, um, but I think that the critical piece uh, for the member opposite who raised that question, seeming to suggest that people in urban communities have nothing to say about farmland, that there's actually a very direct connection that I'd like to bring forward to this House to the economy in British Columbia and the importance of farmland. There is a revolution happening across this province around local food. It's a huge deal. I'm going to start by talking about farmers markets and the impact that they've had on the economy. I'm going to talk about local food and restaurants that attracts tourists from around the world. And then I'm going to talk about the academic research that shows that this bill is headed in the complete wrong direction. The story um, in, in my constituency, in my urban constituency, and why I, I rise to oppose this bill, why I believe it's a priority, not just uh, for the fact that people in my constituency enjoy local food, but also because it's a huge economic driver in Vancouver, and it's a priority from that perspective as well. The farmer's market st story starts in 1994, and it's hard to imagine a time, Mr. Speaker, when this was the reality, but there was no farmer's market in Vancouver. And at that time, a group of people got together and said, you know what, we'd really like to have access to local produce at a farmer's market. There were 15 people who got together and said this would be a great thing to do. Well, when they tried to go ahead and do this, and this was only, this was 1994, this wasn't a long time ago, right? 1994. They, the procedure uh, that they tried to engage in to find a location for the farmer's market was soon met with a huge barrier. The city of Vancouver had rules that made it illegal to sell fruits and vegetables off the back of trucks. There was no area in the city that was zoned to accommodate a market. So they had to form a lobby. They had to go to city council and lobby city council to get local food sold in the city. It took them a long time. It was difficult to do. But they persevered and got a location at the Croatian Cultural Center. It was only one week before opening day when they got a very limited concession from City Council that they could sell fruits and vegetables, and that's it. They weren't going to allow uh, this farmer's market group to poison the community with local eggs and cheese and meat. Um, and uh, it, was, it was halfway through the first season before they were eventually permitted to sell those products. 500 people showed up on that first day 
1995. And it ran for 11 weeks. Uh, the, the economic impact was $40,000 in sales. So that was, that was in recent memory that that took place in Vancouver. Second year of the farmer's market, struggles about location. The third year, the third year, a market started in Coquitlam in response to the success of the farmer's market. In the fourth year, this is just four years, just four years after the first farmer's market was established. Total sales of $414,000 by 1998. A new market established in the West End, and then another market in East Vancouver. Let me tell, let me tell you about the impact of these farmers' markets on the economy, even just in the city of Vancouver, for the farmers who were right. able to attend and sell British Columbia products there. Members, members, I'll remind you that the member from Vancouver Point Grey has the floor, and the speaker would like to hear him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the market now has eight locations. They opened two new locations this year. And the mission, the mission is critical, quote, to foster community health and local economic development through the cre creation of a venue where community members have greater access to safe, healthy, locally produced and environmentally friendly food and where BC producers can market their goods directly to urban consumers. And I hear, I hear my friends across the way mocking farmers markets, that this is just Vancouver, just, this is just Vancouver, this is just zone one, this is just zone one lifestyles, right? Well, in fact, Mr. Speaker, let me tell my friends across the way that this is a provincial phenomenon, that cities across the province have these farmers markets that rely on access to local food coming from across the province. Here are, some, here are some statistics for my friends to enlighten them because clearly they are not aware. A survey of over 9,800 people, this is in case my friends across the way wish to look this up, Mr. Speaker. A survey of over 9,800 people at how many markets? 33 markets across the province found over half of the visitors shop there at least two to three times a month. At the highly popular Squamish Farmers Market, it started six years ago, very small, just 12 vendors. And now they're full, they've got 62 vendors, and they have a waiting list. The impact across BC of farmers markets was greater than $170 million, a 147% increase from the results of a similar study done in just 2006. Total direct sales, $46 million higher, to a total of $113 million. And the study found, and it was asking people across the province, why are you coming to a farmer's market? The five most important uh, factors, nutritional content, whether it's grown or produced in BC, whether it's in season, grown or produced locally, and animal welfare issues. Those are the priorities of people going to farmer's markets across the province. Now the research has shown a 62% increase in the number of markets. And here's the punchline, here's the concern is that the people researching these markets are concerned about a shortage of vendors and competition for vendors. The researcher said, the sharp growth in the number of markets could make it difficult for smaller markets and smaller centers, including in the north, losing vendors going elsewhere. They said that many people are concerned about uh, conventional food systems and they like eating locally across the province and quote, Farmers markets are the most visible and accessible venue to accessing local food. He said the trend bodes well for BC's farmland, quote, as demand for local food increases, it places more importance on the protection of the agricultural land base. And so that's the connection, right, between economic prosperity across the province, the development of an industry now worth over $170 million to the province that just started in 1994 that relies on across the province access for local food because that's what local consumers are looking for and that is what this bill is putting at risk. It's not just farmers markets, it's also restaurants across the province. In my constituency, you may have heard about a celebrity chef, his name is John Bishop. 
And he wrote some very uh, important words about, um, about the connection for him between what he does and the, uh, the Agricultural Land Reserve. He, he wrote a book called Fresh. And in the, in the uh, introduction to that book, he said, Fresh has been inspired by my friendship with Gary and Natty King, a local couple who have farmed organically on a four and a half acre plot of land in the Hazelmere Valley, just one hour south of Vancouver, for more than 20 years. When I first met the Kings about 14 years ago, introduced by my chef, Dennis Green, I was able to see and taste firsthand the incredible array of vegetables they grow. The flavor and quality of this produce, grown without the use of chemicals or pesticides, was far superior to what we had been buying for bishops to that point, and I was hooked. Little did I realize what an impact that first brief meeting would have on my outlook and on my restaurant. Visiting Hazelmere Organic Farm changed my whole way of thinking about sourcing locally grown produce. More than ever before, I realized the importance of knowing where the food we consume comes from. Chefs are very busy people with little time to visit their suppliers personally to see what is available, fresh, and in season. In the past, I, like other chefs, would get on the telephone and place my orders with, with wholesalers who would provide ready peeled vegetables, pre-made salads, even cleaning fluids and paper products. Everything arrived in one convenient delivery. The problem with this system is that I had no real idea where the produce was coming from, who had grown it, and how far it had traveled. Today at Bishop's, we know all the growers and the farmers who provide our food. Our menus are in harmony with the seasons, and much of the produce is grown in the Hazelmere Valley, which is rich with clean water, abundant sunshine, and most of all, fertile soils. And, and these chefs across the province who are buying locally, Zone 1 and Zone 2, are leading a, a local food revolution that is that, uh, that this bill directly threatens. Honorable Speaker, um, I would uh, love to, uh, just noting the hour, I would love to pick this up. I'd like to reserve my place uh, in the debate and continue the debate at the earliest opportunity. Adjourn, adjourn the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. <laughs> member from Vancouver Point Grey. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I rise to uh, resume my uh, remarks relating to Bill 24 and why I'll be voting against this bill. Now, yesterday, uh, I spoke about the importance of farmers' markets to uh, increase the importance of farmers' markets to BC's economy and the concern among some that the rapid growth of farmers' markets will lead to shortages of vendors uh, given uh, apparently insatiable public demand for BC products. And uh, I was speaking about uh, um, Chef uh, John Bishop, and, uh, who uh, is in my constituency and talks about the importance of local food to his work. And uh, another chef, uh, a younger chef, Trevor Bird, that just opened a new business in my community called Fable Restaurant with his colleague Ron, who said, uh, and, and this quote summarizes where the public mind is at in terms of local food and the need to protect agricultural land. Quote, the whole concept of Fable, which is his new restaurant, is knowing where your food comes from and ground up cooking, getting back to fundamentals and doing everything we can ourselves, not bringing mass produced food, if you will. It's all very close to home and very intimate. And honorable speaker, I would say that this understanding of the priority of local food is not unique to my constituency, but is consistent among people across the province, their desire and having locally produced food coming from their local farmers. It's not just the local context, uh, honorable speaker, that we should be considering when we uh, evaluate this bill weakening protections for agricultural land. It's also the international context. Now, currently, uh, we're facing a situation uh, in which uh, agricultural land around the world is being snapped up by international investors because they understand the scarcity of this resource. As global food prices rise, and all you need to do, Honourable Speaker, is look at the front page of today's Vancouver Sun. It talks about the rising price of grocery uh, food uh, in our province. To understand why it is that international investment funds are snapping up land across the world. As we use land for things like biofuels, it drives up the cost of the land, makes it less available. As we use uh, agricultural land, for uh, basic uh, food staples internationally, 
that land uh, for a growing population, uh, that land becomes less and less able to support everybody on the planet. And so that's the international context is that these investment firms are saying, how can we make money? This is their purpose is to make money. They are investing in agricultural land because it is increasingly scarce and increasingly more in demand. And I'm going to read from a professor, not from a million miles away, but from UNBC. He was the recent winner of uh, KUFA's uh, uh, the Canadian uh, University Faculty Association BC's Best New Professor Award uh, recently. I saw him speak at a dinner I was at. It was, uh, it was remarkable, uh, his presentation. His focus in his research is this international phenomenon of snapping up agricultural land because it is so highly valuable. In, a, in the introduction to a paper that he wrote with a number of uh, esteemed Canadian authors, um, he said, quote, over the last few years, land grabbing has become a well-established phenomenon. There are varying estimates of the quality of lands that have changed, quantity of lands that have changed hands during recent years, from a low of 45 million hectares to a high of 227 million hectares although how the counting was done in these estimates is not always clear. The global land rush is characterized by transnational and domestic corporate investors, governments, and local elites taking control over large quantities of land and its minerals and water to produce food, feed, biofuel, and other industrial commodities for the international or domestic markets. Such land deals are often associated with very low levels of transparency, consultation, and respect for the rights of local communities living off the land. In response to concerns over the real and massive experiences of dispossession, violence, and social exclusion, land grabbing has been elevated to an issue of world political significance around which local and transnational resistance has swelled and for which new global governance instruments are being created. The importance of land grabbing as a topic in global governments is well established. The salience is confirmed by events in the real world. Land grabbing is on the agenda at the G8, G20, it's at the core of the World Bank's new global development agenda. Several new global govern governance instruments have been negotiated to address land grabbing. Global civil society and transnational social movements are mobilizing around this phenomenon. And investors and corporations are intensifying their acquisitions and global competition for land. So, Honorable Speaker, we have a bill coming before us that weakens protections to ensure that BC agricultural land is, is here for future generations at the exact same time internationally as there is overwhelming concern around the scarcity of this land and companies snapping it up in order to make a smart investment in the future that will pay off handsomely for them. When we think about what a young farmer needs who, who wants to start out and work in that industry in British Columbia, what do they need? What is the basic thing that they need to get started? It's land. And when you're starting out as a young farmer, the cost of that land is incredibly important. Internationally, we see in these land grabs, and domestically, we see in speculation related to this bill, which reduces protections for agricultural land, that it is causing the cost of land, agricultural land for young farmers to go up, making it less possible for the next generation of farmers to start out in British Columbia. This also excludes local and family farmers and encourages the consolidation of land by huge companies that produce huge scale food for export and, and are not particularly concerned about local farmers markets, which I spent a lot of time yesterday establishing is now worth $170 million a year to BC's economy and to small local producers, the future of food security for our province. I'd like to, uh, and I neglected to mention the name of this uh, professor from UBC, the one who's doing this work on international land grabs. He's, uh, his name is uh, Matthias Margulis, and uh, he's, a very, uh, he's a very new professor up at UNBC, a wonderful institution. He released another paper with uh, nine different scholars, nine scholars who specialize in uh, rural development, come from the Faculty of Agriculture, from Alberta, from Nova Scotia, uh, from Manitoba, as well as UNBC. And the title of their paper is instructive when you, when you come to the content of this bill. The title of their paper is Food Sovereignty and Agricultural Land Use Planning, the Need to Integrate Public Priorities Across Jurisdictions. 
So the bill that's in front of this house proposes to create new lines, create new divisions by breaking things up into six uh, regional panels. And these people who study protecting agricultural land for a living, they spend their time looking at best practices, released a paper calling for the exact opposite approach. Eliminate the boundaries across jurisdictions. Make it uh, a simplified, uh, single responsibility, a single point of contact to deal with pr balancing the priorities around protecting agricultural land and encouraging development. And they situate their, their understanding as well as this international concern around uh, the security and safety of domestic food supply. They say, by way of background, the recent emergence of food sovereignty as a subject of national policy reflects growing public concerns about the security and safety of the domestic food supply. It also reflects concerns about the right of people to define, protect, and regulate domestic agricultural protection and land policies that promote safe, healthy, and ecologically sustainable food production that is culturally appropriate. And they quote a group called the National Farmers Union that argued that, quote, farmer autonomy and control are fast eroding. As farmers lose that control, they lose the ability to make effective long-term plans. And Canadians lose sovereignty over their territory and their food systems. So this is the context uh, in which these, these academics are writing about the best way to preserve agricultural land, which I note is the complete opposite of what this government proposes in this bill. They look uh, historically, well, how is BC doing? How is Canada doing in preserving farmland? Quote, in spite of efforts over the past 40 years, Canada has experienced a continual loss of prime farmland across the country. Hoffman observed, uh, another academic, for example, that since 1971, urban activities have been responsible for the conversion of 12,000 square kilometers of farmland, one half of which was classified as prime agricultural land under the Canada Land Inventory. And I'm sure the members opposite are saying, well, you know, at British Columbia, we've got the ALR, we're, we're leaders in that. Um, and that's certainly true compared to other provinces, and yet here we are trying to weaken that, but I, I, I'm distracting myself from, from the punchline here. The issue is especially acute in Ontario, which contains the country's largest supply of prime agricultural lands, but has been documented elsewhere, including Alberta and British Columbia. Across North America, the historical decline in the economic and social role of agriculture has been accompanied by a significant reduction in and degradation of the prime agricultural land base. This land base faces growing pressures from urban development and the pursuit of other economic priorities with few indications that this trend will be significantly curtailed. And in fact, in this house, we're seeing few indications that this trend will be curtailed because this government has brought forward a bill that is actually weakening protections for BC farmland. As well, the rights and capacities of farmers to use agricultural lands are increasingly compromised by neighboring non-farm uses, such as when residential neighbors file, file unwarranted nuisance complaints about farm odors and noise or sever residential building lots near agricultural operations. And that was exactly what we heard the member from Caribou Chilcotin talking about, was, was establishing residential building lots near agricultural operations. And here, these people who study these programs say, this is something we need to be aware of because it has been an issue in other jurisdictions. Now, the, the most important part of this paper is not the history, is not the erosion of agricultural land, is not food security for the purposes of our House uh, discussion here today for our debate. The most important part of this paper is when these people who have spent their lives, who have PhDs studying this issue, what are best practices for protecting farmland, they say that the best approach is a unified approach not a fractured approach that this bill um, recommends. So they go through all of this evidence and then they say, they identify one of the big problems, one of the big problems that's led to this is, that, is the fractured nature of different jurisdictions having different pieces of protecting agricultural land and as a result, uh, the land not being protected at all. Consequently, the national significant, nationally significant yet localized nature of agricultural land use issues points to the need for coordination among multiple jurisdictions. The issues, however, are complicated, as difficulties of cohabitation are not just related to scale, the proximity of farm and non-farm uses, which means farms and people living there who aren't farmers, 
but can also be related to the difference in cultural values and how land and activities, farm, and other commercial uses are managed. Land protection alone is not adequate over the long term. Better management processes are needed. This means being able to accompany farmers in the development of their activities and helping non-farm people integrate better into the rural community. Here's the punchline. Reconciling competing interests for agricultural lands remains a complicated process that crosses multiple jurisdictions. And yet, this bill, instead of fixing that issue, supporting farmers, as these, um, as these people argue, is so integral to making sure that they're able to continue as farmers, um, these academics say it's already complicated. This bill wants to establish now six different panels to consider this instead of one. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And so the, instead of making life more complicated with different panels, with different priorities, with different people all across the province, a single panel evaluating proposals on a provincial scale is clearly the right approach. Now we heard the Minister for Corps of Youth stand up in this house and tell a story about somebody who wanted to remove land from the Agricultural Land Reserve as the justification for why he is pushing so hard to make sure that this reform goes through. The story, though, he used to illustrate his argument was incredibly bizarre because in that story, uh, the person was actually able to remove the land from the ALR. And if the statistics tell us anything, um, that wasn't the exception. It's not the inability to remove land from the ALR that this bill is, is aiming to address. Let me give you some statistics from uh, the David Suzuki Foundation. These are, these are dated, but, but they are important. Now, the, the first thing is, and the government will tell you, that the ALR's total land base has remained fairly consistent throughout its history. But the, the way that this happened was to take prime agricultural land out of the Agricultural Land Reserve and replace it with low productivity uh, land uh, in uh, northern BC. We heard the member from Caribou Chicotin read a letter that called this approach a smokescreen, uh, which I agree with entirely. Um, it, that letter was, uh, was a very helpful letter to understand this government's approach to the ALR. Quote, uh, its growth, however, occurred mainly through the addition of less productive land in northern BC. Since the, since the reserve was created, according to the Agricultural Land Commission statistics, the lower mainland, Vancouver Island, and the Okanagan have experienced a net loss of more than 35,000 hectares. 90% of the land has been added to the reserve. 90% of the land added to the reserve has been in the north. 72% of the land lost has been in the south. In the four years, and this is this is this is how um, this is why it's difficult to understand the concern that it's hard to get land out of the agricultural land reserve. In the four years ending in March 2005, the commission statistics shows that approved the removal of 71.4% of the reserves, 7,493 hectares under consideration. 71.4% approval rate. Land removal rates in the uh, uh, Agricultural uh, Land uh, uh, Commission's uh, regions was highest in Vancouver Island. 86.8% of the requests to remove land were approved. In the Kootenai region, 84.5% of the requests were approved. And in the Okanagan, 81% of the requests were approved. And then uh, it looks like uh, for the remaining jurisdictions, you had about a 50-50 chance. On the south coast, 55.5% of the land was removed. In the interior, 52.6%. And in the north, 46.8%. So when you have those kinds of statistics that when you make an application to the Agricultural Land Reserve, uh, you've got a, somewhere between a 46 and 86% chance of success in your application. It's hard to understand this concern that it's difficult to get land out of the Agricultural Land Reserve, that it's time for some sort of dramatic erosion of those standards. How much higher does this government want those numbers to get before it will be satisfied um, with the ALR's performance? Honorable Speaker, the, uh, the opposition here set up a website inviting people to write in letters to us sharing their concerns about uh, the Agricultural Land Reserve. 
Um, I, uh, I see uh, that the green light is, is on for me, which means that my time here is limited. I hope that I get the opportunity to rise and speak again to this so that I can share some of these stories, the overwhelming number of stories. And I know the government has one or two letters, uh, which I heard actually from uh, the, the member from Caribou Chilcotin, which expressed concern around how the ALR has been operating. Um, but it was hardly a ringing endorsement of the government's approach to the ALR to date. I'm going to, I'm going to, and Honourable Speaker, the member says uh, maybe I should listen. Thank you. And uh, certainly it's my hope that the government listens uh, to the community when it comes to the ALR. 